Welcome back, everyone, for our second session. And I see most of you made it back with your body parts intact. Most. Almost all of you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just another story. You just have a story to share later on. Sorry about your, your little tumble out there. And then at, were, were all of you at the opening session? Because I'm going to reference it. And I'm like, wow, if you weren't there, you might not get a couple things. And then, okay, so you were all here. No one is going to watch me and go, what is she talking about? Um, and then also, I realized when I recorded the podcast from this morning that I did not catch your intro. And so the whole, what's my ask comment oh my didn't get on. But then I referenced it later on in the talk. So if you do happen to share that podcast, you might want to tell them, like, what is she even talking about? <laughs> it's going to feel a little bit out of context. So... <laughs> just embellish it. Oh, she was really crazy. That speaker lady. Wow. Non-denominational church people, you know how they are. Just leave it on that. <laughs> All right. Hey, so how many of you remember when you were a little girl, or maybe you had little girls like this, or maybe long-haired boys like my friend does, um, you remember um, dealing with your hair and the tangles? Anyone really especially oh challenged God. in that area? Um, and then, like, the sprays that you would use to try to tame it down, and the combing, and the tears, and the yanking, like your mom was trying to kill you. And she probably was, because she was probably really frustrated by that moment also. Uh, maybe screaming was involved, temper tantrums, and if you were living in close, close quarters to neighbors, maybe they were hearing it and maybe reporting you. Who knows? Uh, not that that ever happened to me at all. <laughs> so, and Lita, that's you. Or uh, you had a child or you knew of someone um, who went through all, all that. But who, who relates to that with the hair and the challenges? Oh, wow. Okay. A lot of you. It must be a Lutheran thing. I don't know. You guys have really <laughs> hair issues? Okay. Um, so that tangle and that mess and that screaming and, and just the challenge of dealing with all of that. I think about that in terms of the messes that we have in our own lives and the tangle of the messes that we actually end up getting ourselves into and how they leave us feeling like the little girl under the comb um, with the detangling spray and the wincing and the wriggling and the wishing that it would just be over and end and maybe just shaving your head. Yeah, you know, right. Britney Spears, it, just do it, be done with it, right? Wanting it to just be over and to leave and to, and to cover it up, maybe just stick a cute hat on it and uh, it'll all just be done, right? Amen? So my ministry with women grew out of untangled, tangled, messy, not so messy stories like that. And gathering with women who were brave, brave enough to share and to get real, and uh, not just in one-on-one -on -one person, but in, in groups, and to be honest with other women. There's something actually detangling, in a sense, about getting your story out. It swirls around in, in a tangled mess inside of you. It can really feel jumbled <coughs> and muddled, and it feels purposeless. It feels like you can't make sense of it, and you wish there was a detangling spray for your soul, in a sense. It's odd, and it's really uncomfortable in the power that it ends up having over you. And getting that out, even if it's just in your own journaling time, starts to untangle it a bit. Not completely unraveled, that's different, but untangling and reordering. And it gets sense back into it, you know? And once it's out of your body, even again, if it's just into a journal, or if it's out of your mouth and to the ears of a comforting friend, once it's outside of your own body, it's like it, it doesn't have the same power over you. It's freeing. Think of a child on a swing and the difference with a child that has matted hair stuck and tangled or free-flowing, untangled hair just gliding back and forth on a swing and that feeling of that wind just rushing through you and rushing through the hair. It's very freeing. Can you picture it? Coming away to a retreat like this is another way of sharing, sharing our freedom with each other. But I want to ask you a question tonight. What makes this, this and other gatherings similar to it, different than just getting together and joining a country club, let's say, or a knitting club, or a quilting, or a book, or a photography, or any club, or any social group? What makes it different? I mean, aren't gatherings of women just groups who come together around a common interest? 
Isn't that what we do, right, as women? Or maybe gathering around to support a common cause? Are we in a, a group at church because our common interest is religion or spirituality, Jesus? Do we come together so we can do good things and be charitable? Some of you are today in the swirl of that tangle and that knottedness and that tied up situation. And some of you are happy to be on the other side of that to some extent. And I know that hearing from women this weekend is going to really encourage you no matter where you are in that journey. You're going to benefit because you'll have one of those I'm not the only one moments, right? That's why we love to raise your hand and kind of glance to the right or to the left. I'm not the only one who doesn't get this or doesn't know what's happening or does, whatever, right? We connect. Even if the exact details of the story don't particularly relate, some aspect of what a woman will share will touch inside your heart, and you'll benefit, and you'll know other women, and you'll know how to be able to share with God and with others. Even talking to your own self improves how you dialogue to yourself, and that'll all change when you get involved and you connect, but we have to be sure that the, the connection and the communities that we form aren't just a social club, that it's really about Jesus Christ, about what we just did taking communion, right? Making sure that what we do as church isn't just a, a, another Christian religious way of being in a country club. Because if we do that, we've lost the real significance and the power of being in this kind of community that makes it different than book club and quilt club and all the other fun clubs that we can do. We have to get this right, ladies. We are surrounded by other women in our own lives who are dying for the kind of hope that we have and that we're experiencing this weekend. We have, to, we have to protect that, ladies. We have to go back home tomorrow. I, I won't be here speaking tomorrow to you, and so I just want to give you that as kind of my closing way of saying, don't go home and turn church back into a club. Make sure it's about Jesus Christ, and make sure that you're taking ownership of God <coughs> as, as you uh, fellowship with one another. So my talk tonight is called Satisfied. If you're the note taker and you want to put a little title up there, it's called Satisfied. It's about how I found satisfaction and true healing in God and how everything changes when we find our satisfaction in God first and in God fully. And I hope the food that you've had tonight and this weekend has satisfied you. Has it? Isn't it good? It was really good. <laughs> and the friendship and the laughter is satisfying and the sharing and the testimonies and the making fun of people at their expense. <laughs> All those fun things that we do is very satisfying to our soul. And isn't that beautiful how God created us to be satisfied in all those wonderful ways? Isn't that great? But most of all, I want you to come to see how freeing it is, really freeing it is to be truly satisfied when God satisfies you first and completely and totally and fully. So again, um, feel free to take notes if you want to just listen. This podcast will be up later on my podcast, Dwelling Richly. So this morning I shared uh, my testimony, Restored, and how God restored my husband and he restored me and he restored our marriage. And tonight I'm gonna to share a part of my story that is really my own struggle with depression, um, with sexual purity. I'm so glad that guy's not here. I was like, oh my gosh, he's gonna hear this. Story. <laughs> when I walked in, there's a man in the room. Okay, get ready, Parker. <laughs> his name was on the podcast. Anyway, um, sexual purity, I'll say it again. And with healing. And um, in a way, this part of my story is the reason that I was able to share the other. I'm humbled, and I'm in process, and I'm a woman who's been wooed by God. I'm a woman who heard God speak over me words of love and acceptance despite my shame and guilt. And I heard, you are beautiful, my love. I see no flaw in you. And I've come to accept that, and I've come to receive those words, but it's been a journey. So I've been enveloped fully. And I've been healed by that truth. And there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And I pray that each of you today would experience that same feeling that I have because of Jesus Christ. So would you join with me in prayer? Actually, let's hold hands at our tables. Father God, we come before you tonight as a woman and we feel the warmth of the hand that we're holding. And we say thank you, God, for these women. 
who come together here under the banner of your love and the power of your name. And God, I just ask that you would go before us as you already have in this moment. Bless our time together. Clear our thoughts. Make our hearts open. Give us that fertile ground we need for you to plant the seeds of your truth in our life and let it grow and be watered and strengthened because of this fellowship and because of your word. I ask that you would bless us once again in the power of Jesus' name. Everyone said Amen. 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 All right. So I like to time travel, as you noticed from this morning in my talks. And we're going to go back to second grade in my, in my talk this morning. When I was in um, second grade, um, you might have heard me mention a little bit this morning, we were actually living in a parsonage um, in the Simi Valley, California. Uh, parsonage is a little house behind a church. Non-denominational people have no idea that maybe Lutherans, you guys already knew that. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, at this time in my life, my dad was a full-time pastor. My mom was an organist and a pianist with the church. Um, she was a church secretary and whatnot. And like I said, I was in second grade. I had two younger sisters, and we were pastor kids. Like I mentioned this morning, we were poor. <laughs> That's the official term, pastor kids, poor. You can just look it up in any dictionary. We were super-duper pastor poor. So we were food stamp poor. We were really poor. Did I mention we were poor? Anyway, um, poor, poor, poor. And so um, if we wanted to have anything, any special food or any clothes or anything special, it would always end up getting donated. Like, I have, I have so many stories I can tell about this. You could just invite me back. I'll just tell you, you know, stories and stories and stories about this. But um, if we wanted cool clothes uh, that weren't hand crocheted by Grandma, Libby Grandma, um, we'd have to get those donated as well. And every now and then, a lot of um, donated clothes would show up from the people in the church or the people in the general community. And when that happened, my two sisters and I knew the rule. Here's the rule. Don't touch the box. Don't touch the box. When the box of donated clothes shows up, you don't touch. No going through the donated clothes. No trying on the clothes. No, that was only for mom. She got to go through all of that first. She had her reasons for that. People don't always donate appropriate things, turns out. So, I mean, it was the 70s. So, and so these donations came from the general community, and who knows what kind of paraphernalia was left in the pockets. And so we were told, no, I didn't know this back then, but I know that in a grown-up brain now, uh, why? So maybe, I don't know, my mom, I pictured like some leopard skin bikini would show up or something like that. Uh, or negligee would get, would get donated. Who knows? You never know what's going to show up in the box. Anyway, what was the rule? Don't touch the box. Don't touch the box. It's a very strict rule. Very strict rule in my family. <laughs> All right. So mom goes to the box first, and we keep what she approved, and then toss back all the rest, the sexy bikinis or whatever else was in that box. All right. So me, little dreamy, second grade me, pastor's kid me, I had this dream, and I had a big dream. I had a weird ask, in a sense, I guess. We're just going to keep on playing that one up. Um, <laughs> that someday, somehow, in that box... Right there in that box of clothes would be what was super in and popular right then. And this was not ditto, so it was later in my life. <laughs> my stories a lot have to do with clothes. I started realizing that. But anyway, um, my dream was that there would be a pair of uh, short shorts, little cute white short shorts. They were really big back then. Um, and then along with that, that I, they would maybe possibly, this is really dreaming big, knee-high go-go boots. <laughs> <laughs> Second grade. <laughs> okay, but you remember those? I wanted short shorts and I wanted knee high go go boots. Who was I? Little pastor's kid. Whatever. All right, I turned out okay somehow. All right, um, and I prayed about it. I'm sure I did. <laughs> My little second grade ver uh, version of that. So one day a box arrives. What's the rule? What's the rule? What's the box? <laughs> one day a box arrives, and I just so happen to be alone in our little parsonage house in Little Simi Valley, California. Mom is over at the church, and she's giving piano lessons or organ lessons or doing whatever mom churchy things she does. And she happened to also be with my two sisters at the time. So who was alone in the house with the box? Yours truly was. I was alone with the box. What's the rule? So, of course, as the good Christian, obedient child that I was, I went and did my devotional. I had prayer time, right? No, I did not do that. I first ran to the back window which looked over the backyard, which butted up against the church parking lot. And about 100 yards from there was the church. And I looked, and there was no one in sight. Parking lot empty. Mom and sisters tucked somewhere deep inside the catacomb inside that little church. And um, I thought, oh, my gosh, if I am really, really quick and do this right, 
I could dig through those clothes before anyone walked back to the house. And so I took one final glance out the window and really checked the skeins, scattered it out really well. And um, no one, no one. And I glanced back to the box that was sitting there still by the front door. And I made a mad focus stash for that box of hope, ladies, that box of hope. You know, if you're one of those people who really don't believe that God actually hears and answers prayers, this story is going to change your mind. Are you ready for this? I can't believe this. Forget how God answered the prayers, and delivered his people from the Egyptians. <laughs> How God miraculously provided food from ravens to feed the good prophet Elijah, or changed water into wine, God bless him. God heard the prayers of my seven-year-old little self, and guess what? Yes, short shorts. And not just short shorts, white short shorts. Yes, yeah, no go-go boots. I know, right? Whatever, God. Okay, so... Um, I dug through and I found the uh, the short shorts. Maybe um, I was talking too fast and God didn't get the whole go-go boots part, but whatever in my prayer, I've learned to slow down a bit since then. So I grabbed the uh, the shorts. I tossed everything back really quickly into uh, the box. I glanced back out the window and it was all clear still. No mom, no sisters, nobody. And I, I dashed from my room to slip those bad boys on, right? And I already had a cute halter top in mind to go with my short shirts. So I raced to the bedroom full-length mirror, put it all on, and I'm like, look at me. And I'm checking myself out in the mirror, and I've got my halter top on, and I'm like, when is mom going to be home? When is mom going to be home? i got to be careful on all of this. So my best girlfriend lived up and around the corner from our house at the time, Wendy Yeck. I've tried to find her on Facebook. I really have. It would be really fun if I could find her someday. But anyway, um, I figured if my mom came home, she would never know. The only challenge was getting to Wendy Yeck's house because, of course, you don't have social media to post yourself on. you got to go to your friend in person and actually show them your amazing out, outfit, hashtag blessed. So um, I, I figure it all out, and um, her house is up and around from our house, and her house is around the corner, and it's the first house on the other street on the other side of us. But to get there, I had to walk up out onto the sidewalk that passed in front of the church, and then by a local park, and then around the corner back into her house. Dun, 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 right? Like a mission is ready to start. All right. So all this crazy thinking fully taken hold, and I decided to go for it. And I headed out the front door, up the main street, and I started walking, strutting, really, uh, down the sidewalk toward Wendy's house where she would greet me and she would see me in all my glory and my ridiculously cool new short shorts and she would die and we'd scream and we'd have a great time together laughing and just getting all excited about it. Well, I'm going to pause the story again right here. Pick it up at the end. You know the drill. Um, so if anyone does come in the middle of this, it's like, what is going on in this talk? Uh, you can fill them in later. Anyway, so now we're going to fast forward again to a few months into our marriage. It was 1988, as you know. Uh, like I shared before in my story earlier, our marriage started off like many and most romantic, just perfect, picture perfect. And um, my husband uh, made some pretty big switches in his mindset early on in our marriage. His dissatisfaction, his depression came out early in our marriage. He was very unpredictable in his behavior, very dark cloud would be over our house. I was a full-time teacher. I love teaching. After a long day, I might have been tired, but I was so fulfilled and so happy as a teacher, happy about everything going on, everything related to that. But I would come home to unexpected anger, unexpected outbursts, darkness, sadness from Glenn, and I would never know. We had these seasons of peace and of joy and of happiness, but they were always disturbed by these crazy storms. They were dark. Storms of rage and disappointment and manipulation, it would just swirl around our home. There was no escaping for me. And I found myself really in shock about all of this and then in fear. And then I reached out and I called a pastor, the pastor who had married us, and I asked for advice. Very sweet man, man that I love, and he's passed away now, but his advice was to pray for him and that he would grow out of it. And then act like that and they, they grow out of it. It's really warm in here to me. Is it? It, it feels warm, yeah. Okay. Well, there. Oh. It will? Okay. If I pass out before it does, then oh, there'll okay. be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Passive aggressive at all for a bit. All right. All right. <laughs> so um, I called a woman in our church who'd been married for a while and she had grown children. She'd been through more seasons than I had and I told her about what was going on. I, I kind of brought her in on it all and her advice, are you ready for this one? Give him more sex. Give him more sex. 
Um, he'll grow out of it, she said. Um, be more sexy. He'll grow out of it. Wow. And I read books about it, and all the books that I got a hold of said to be more submissive, a submissive wife, um, to be a better Proverbs 31 wife, and that I would grow into that. Basically, the advice in those first years of my marriage was constantly bombarding me with marriage is hard, everything's going to get better, just keep on keeping on. And that was the advice that I got everywhere. Very well-meaning, right? But definitely missing the mark in my case, knowing what was ahead in our marriage. But I doubled up my efforts to be a submissive wife. I really did. To be a biblical wife. I wanted to be that so badly. And I can sum up the advice I heard in three basic phrases. Be flawless like the Proverbs 31 woman. Be submissive to your husband no matter what. And be obedient no matter what. And that was the message that was constantly in my mind in that young stage of our marriage. And I know that that understanding wasn't balanced with wisdom and understanding. It was from the Bible, but it wasn't biblical. But it's essentially what I had been taught and what I was still hearing from people that I looked up to, the people that I sought for counsel. And so I just let it keep on piling on and figured, I, okay, I'll just try harder and try and be better and, and work more. I kept on in that way of thinking, I love God. I really, really had a strong faith. I had assurance because of my faith that I trusted God and I was going to be rewarded. And I did everything that I knew to do. I was joyful. I was filled in my teaching life. I was, I was loving in our church life and our ministry. I had a lot of fun with Glenn in between the storms, but the darkness came more and more frequently. The light was really only when we would travel to special events, going out with our family, vacations, dates with friends, and so on. A party, right? But we'd always come home and the laughter and the distraction would end and we'd go back to this dark place. So I began to fantasize about leaving, not divorce, just escaping, literally escaping, okay, and starting a new life somewhere else. I figured maybe the witness protection program, I could find some reason, you know, I could get involved, something I had to get out, I would just make up my own life somewhere else, literally just leave walk away from everything. I planned it a lot inside my little brain. I worked out that a lot. I thought about my husband dying a lot. Terrible, I know, but I did. I thought about him dying and I thought about that would free me without the stain of divorce, which was in my mind, the unforgivable sin. That kind of fantasizing led me to be open in sexual sin in my own mind. Finding another life meant finding another man. Starting my life over somewhere else. <coughs> I covered it. What I thought other women had in their husband, I wanted that. And it wasn't too long when those thoughts became flesh. Listen to what Jesus' brother James wrote. You can turn to James chapter 1 in your Bible. James chapter 1. And I'm going to read this from a great paraphrase um, called the J.B. Phillips paraphrase. If you're on your phone app, you might be able to find it there. James chapter 1 says, temptation is due to the pull of a man's own inward desires, which can be enormously attractive. His own desire takes hold of him, and that produces sin. And sin in the long run means death. Make no mistake about that. So the internet at this time had just opened up. You can start to date this story by that. And an initially innocent search that I did on um, a woman's issue um, accidentally opened up a really, really graphic and inappropriate website, and I shut it down quickly, super shocked. But later on, I went back out of curiosity, and that curiosity triggered my normal curiosity because it also triggered something I had been exposed to as a young girl, which was pornography. My own pa parents had struggled with sexual sin. I was conceived before they were married. Then that sin came up and off and on into their marriage and impacted me as a young girl when I discovered pornography in their bedroom. From fifth grade on, I was exposed to porn from friends and other people I would engage with. So those thoughts came back into my mind. And rather than bringing that before God and taking it all to a place where I could share and be heard, I shut it down in shame and I just let it simmer there inside me. So when my marriage was so painful and so hurtful, 
I could find no sound counsel to help me in that season. I started escaping more and more in my mind, and sometimes even on the internet. Not only with the images that I could scroll through, but even in the anonymity of chat rooms with other men, my own darkness, my secret life, detaching from reality, halted very abruptly, though, one morning. You see, while I had this secret, I was still putting on a good outfit, if you will, of a Christian wife. I wore the hats of a good Christian wife, a mother, a worker, a ministry leader. I even did morning devotions. Why? Because that's what good Christian women do. And one morning for my devotions, I was reading Psalm 90. Go ahead and jump over there, Psalm 90. Have you ever been reading something you just, to get it done? Like a checklist? Just me? Okay. So, <laughs> so just like checking your list to be done, you're, and then you're jolted into a moment of reality and truth, well, here's what I read, and I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to weave into the reading the actual thoughts that I had that morning. So hang in there with me as I kind of move you through what happened to me reading Psalm 90 that day. You ready? So Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountain uh, mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And two verses in, I thought, I wonder how long this chapter is. <laughs> and I glanced. Okay, it's only 17 verses. And you just looked out, didn't you? Also, yeah. <laughs> All right. So I kept reading. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. Dust, dust. Oh, uh, man. Did all that dust he made end up in my house? I need to dust those shelves and my mind is wandering. Verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Or as a watch in the night. Yada, yada. God is big. I know all this. Verse 5. You sweep them away as with a flood. Wow, that's dramatic. They are like a dream. I've got to remind myself to sweep up later, too. Okay, errands. Get them done. Okay, put off in my brain. All right, verse 6. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. So we are brought to an end by your anger, but your wrath. We are dismayed. Yawn, focus, almost halfway. Here we go. Verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Wait, what? secret sins <laughs> that jumped out at me because that's exactly what I had big fat ugly shameful secret sin I was actually enjoying that sin I was drawn to it it's not like I didn't know I was sinning I was doing it on purpose I knew it I ignored the truth I closed my bible <laughs> wrapped up my checklist morning devotion done but my stomach was sick and was under full conviction of the Holy Spirit. You see, sometimes the wooing of God is a gentle song, like I shared this morning. It calls us to him, and it surrounds us, and it cradles us, and it cushions us. And sometimes it's a gut punch, like a holy knuckle sandwich. <laughs> and I opened up the word again, and I forced myself to read to the end, verse 9. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are gone soon and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Or as the New Living translates, who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Wow, I'm thinking, who wrote this song? What was this guy's experience with God? Look at the top of your Bible right there at the top of the chapter. Who wrote it? A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Ha ha, okay then. Surely he knew the wrath of God. He'd seen God's judgment on Egypt, those plagues. He'd heard God's booming voice. He witnessed God open up the ground and swallow a bunch of complainers. Wow. Whiny little ungrateful complainers and gulp. The ground swallowed them up right there. If Moses, the man of God himself, was saying that we didn't really grasp the wrath, of God, how much less was I grasping it? And worse, trifling with such a secret sin. And then I read the verses that changed everything. Verse 12, so teach us to number our days. My days weren't numbered. My days were a blur of surviving this messy marriage, fantasizing I had about leaving 
Teach us to number our days. Why? That we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom? I shut that down a long time ago with my failed attempts at being a Proverbs 31 woman. Verse 13. Return or relent in the NIV. Oh Lord, return or relent. How long? Have pity on your servants. Relent? Relent from what? What was Moses asking God to relent from and, and come back from? I looked back up and I saw again, oh, the wrath of God part. Well, I wasn't feeling any wrath. There weren't any plagues on me. He hadn't smited me. No fire, no brimstone, secret sinner. It wasn't really hurting anyone. Is God just ignoring me for now? Waiting to get around to me after smiting some other more terrible sinners? I felt so ignored and so alone anyway, but I also realized that I had felt out of touch. The God I knew in my mind, who I knew in my mind was the God who sees and the God who hears and the God who heals. Was that God for other people? It wasn't for me. I was in this terrible marriage. I probably deserved it because I had jumped ahead of God's best plan. We had sex before marriage. I wasn't a good Proverbs 31 woman. I had a problem with sexual sin now in my own life. I really was doing fine just getting ignored by God. Besides, God's best was either too far away or if it was close by and this was it, this was God's best. My marriage as it was, how I was experiencing it now. Um, no, thank you. No, I didn't like this at all. His version of best and mine were not aligned in any way. Then I read five words that ultimately changed everything. Verse 14, satisfy us in the morning. Satisfy me. I'm part of us. Was I satisfied? Really? I was about as far as anyone could possibly be from actually satisfied. I'm so unsatisfied in my marriage and my mothering and the prospects for my future. And worst of all, in my own identity. Satisfy me with your steadfast, unfailing love that, that we, that I may rejoice or sing for joy and be glad all my days. I kept reading and I kept personalizing it, that I may sing for joy, that I may be glad for all my days. Make me glad. Verse 15, for as many days as you have afflicted me, I thought I felt afflicted by God, but I definitely felt separated from him. And, and that in my mind was kind of worse and for as many years as we have seen evil or trouble, verse 16, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. That's what I was longing for. Satisfaction, favor, wisdom, days that add up and mean something, something significant. And I was wasting them away in fantasy land. And I was angering God with my sin, and I knew it. My husband had his own issues with sin, but my focus and my resentment had been on his bad behavior and how unfair it was that his behavior hurt us so much. And here I was with my own dark response to that, really adultery in my mind, murder in my mind, coveting, lying, all of this I had committed in my heart. The Ten Commandments broken, all of them, at my feet. Some people's darkness is, is loud, and it's strong, and it's thundering like my husband's, and anyone could really see it, and that was Glenn's. Others have inner darkness, secrets stashed away, quiet, and kept like a little evil pet, and that was me. I was bringing Christ to that computer screen instead of bringing myself to his feet. I was shutting down the voice of the Holy Spirit in my heart instead of listening for the song of God, wooing and woohooing. And now in Psalm 90, hey, youing, <laughs> I could hear the lies of my own lustful flesh, my own lustful eyes, the pride that I had in my own version of my own life. My husband's sins were his, but I was escaping into a darkness and sin instead of finding satisfaction in God's light. And in God's hope, that morning was the end of those fantasies. And it was the beginning of seeing reality. Instead of getting lost in futile thinking, I was found once again in the hope because of God's word. And I realized that the call to be satisfied first and satisfied fully in him was on every page of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It was a longing of God's very heart that we would be satisfied in him. 
I went all the way back to the garden. I thought of Adam and Eve and what they traded in because they did not let themselves be satisfied and wooed by God. Isaiah 55. Turn over to that with me. Isaiah 55. Beautiful, beautiful the words of the prophet. And maybe you were like me and you even sang a song version of this growing up as a kid from the, from the King James. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the water. Listen. Come all you who are thirsty. And aren't we all thirsty? Aren't we all thirsting and longing? Aren't we all parched? Come to the waters, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 55. Come to the waters, you who have no money. Come and buy and eat. You have no resources? You have no way of getting wine and milk and money? You don't have to worry about that. God says, I got you. Come buy wine and come buy milk. And don't have to worry about money and buy it without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? And was not that the desire of my heart to be satisfied? Over time, two things began to happen that led me to this big aha moment. Not really a moment, but like a series of awakenings, like getting your hair detangled, isn't it? Like, not like, hey, presto, ta-da, and your hair is just runaway ready and your tangles are all gone, right? <laughs> it takes time and it takes detangling spray and the Holy Spirit is working on a tangled mess of my heart and spritz and release and tug and love and lather, rinse, repeat, really. And what two things or awareness came to me? Well, first, I became aware that my satisfaction was really misplaced. And secondly, scripture, I had misapplied that. I had been sincerely but poorly taught about what a godly woman and wife should be and do. So I had misplaced satisfaction and I had misapplied scripture. The Holy Spirit showed me and I realized I had been registering seasons of my life as either satisfying or not satisfying to me. Marrying my college sweetheart, satisfied. Happy job, satisfied. Darkness in my marriage, not satisfied. Fulfilled at church, satisfying. Husband, shocking behavior, not satisfied. A good season of peace, satisfied. Infertility, not satisfied. Getting pregnant after seven years of infertility, satisfied. Not being able to ever conceive again, not satisfied. What a ride, so exhausting. It's not that I had earlier found true satisfaction in, in Jesus, it's not that I hadn't found that already. Jesus, the lover of my soul, I wouldn't have experienced any of that disappointment. It's that while I was there, my heart would have been filled and satisfied in Jesus. And it's not that I had abandoned Jesus, it's that I was treating him like a social media friend, following him for what I could find interesting or motivational. Instead of surrendering every corner of my heart and my mind and my soul to him and finding ultimate satisfaction in him first and in him fully, not only that, but my satisfaction was about this deep because I knew that past, that surface, my imperfect body, my distracted mind, my faithless heart. So finding satisfaction felt so elusive. I just turned to fantasizing to escape the darkness. Satisfaction isn't about getting what I want but in humbling my heart to be satisfied truly, again, in God first and in God fully. It's shifting the aim of my satisfaction off of my own needs, my own plans, my own hopes and expectations. Paul, writing from prison and shackled between two soldiers, wrote a lot about satisfaction. In Philippians, you're probably familiar with this really popular and hope-filled verse, Philippians 4.13. You probably know it by heart. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But consider the context of that verse. We often see it yanked out of scripture and printed on our t-shirts and mugs and magnets and cards. But Paul wrote those words of encouragement while in prison after having been beaten so severely they thought he was dead having been shipwrecked, having been bitten by a deadly viper, beaten again, now in prison, shackled between these two guards. And here's the context of what he actually wrote. I have learned, he said, I have learned in whatever situation that I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of, of having plenty and, and having hunger and abundance and need. That's the context in which he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All of that. Here's what's really cool is you want to geek out with me a little bit on the Greek, all right? That word content, I want to be content in Philippians, is really this cool Greek word that only appears one time in the Bible, okay? It's uh, atarkes, atarkes. And it's from this root word of auto, right? Self, like cars, like automobile. 
and archaeo, which means satisfied. <laughs> Self-satisfied. It means you're satisfied because you're independent from the circumstances around you. You're self-satisfied because you're independent and you're living in God's fullness. It, it points really to true sufficiency, the kind that you get when you have the inflowing power of Jesus Christ in your life. If anyone asked me if I was satisfied in God or by God, I would have said, absolutely. I would have quoted some Christianish answer, but was I truly content, truly a tar case, truly satisfied in God? Not really. I wasn't satisfied like that. I was teeter, tottering between resigned or rebellious. And my resignation came when I felt hopeless and trapped, and I just wanted to crawl in. My rebellion was when I was hopeless and I fantasized about escaping. Resignation led me to depression and even suicidal thoughts. Rebellion led me to sexual sin and my plans to escape. And what I saw now was my need for total satisfaction in God first and fully. Anything, my plans, my job, my future, anyone, my husband, myself, <clears throat> took a huge shift off that apex point focus of my life and it was a massive relief resulting in this really fresh outlook for me and really strong hope. I admitted that I accepted Jesus. I loved him. I followed him. I was committed to him, but I was not satisfied, not really in him. There was no satisfaction in my life, not in the ways that I had actually defined it. So I traded truth for a lie. And I justified my sins because of the wrongs being done to me and the sadness that I felt I was enduring. And I needed to truly dwell in the word of God and to know God. I needed to see him before my own troubles. That I had to see my sin as a sin deserving of the wrath of God. And I had to know, really, really know the truth of God so I went back to the word, old school, and I looked up satisfaction and satisfied and satisfy and content and contentment and all the synonyms for that word in the Bible. And here's some of the things that I found. First, whatever, whatever ends in satisfaction, any of those words or root words, um, as in on the right hand they will devour but still be hungry. On the left they would eat but not be satisfied. Ecclesiastes 5. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Proverbs 27. Death and destruction are never satisfying and neither are human eyes. Isaiah 55. I spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what is not satisfying. So what about satisfaction? Listen to the difference and the focus. Psalm 22. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. Psalm 63. I will praise you as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. And on and on and on my studies went. And up to that point, I had thought of verses like Jeremiah 29 11 when it came to my contentment. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and not to harm you. I thought about that as my personal life verse. Yeah, God's got this, and he's got great plans for me that are good and prospering and, and keeping me free from harm. Sign me up twice. I mean, I wasn't really ignorant of all the trials that came into my life. At this point in my life, my dad had been diagnosed with the worst form of multiple sclerosis and was rapidly de declining. My mom had attempted suicide. My former roommate was killed on a missions trip. I knew hard times came. It was just I was so disconnected with what that would feel like in my own home, in my own heart, and how excruciating and disappointing, disappointing it would be. I had been applying the promises in God's word to my own life, just like wearing cool clothes from a donation box. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about that story. We'll get there. That morning, checking off Psalm 90 in my devotional time, I was moved, really moved, literally moved. I moved off my chair onto my knees. I wept. I laid my head low onto the ground. I confessed. I repented. I, I spread it all out to God, and I asked him, create in me a new spirit, and he did. Being satisfied in him first and fully was then and has been my mission from that point on. I prayed that he would give me a heart of wisdom and that he would teach me to number my days so I'd be more sensitive to anything that was allowing me to keep my satisfaction from being found in him. So this is a sin that I have to continue to confess as my weak heart is so prone to wander and not to even let it take the slightest foothold. Job's covenant became mine as well. He said in chapter 31 of Job, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully. 
this moment was a 180 in my life, but it wasn't like it was all done. My own heart is deceitful and wicked, like Jeremiah said. Who can understand it? But that morning when God met me and the words from Psalm 90 wooed me, like I said, and woo-hooed me and hey-you'd me, <laughs> laid before me life and death. It brought the strength and the change in my heart that I needed to weather the storms that were ahead in our marriage. And that shift was the reason that I was able to stay faithful during the storms that were still coming to us. Finding satisfaction like that in God made all the difference. Ladies, that's my prayer for you today. Seek him first. Not for fixing your issues. Not for changing your circumstances. Be satisfied, just satisfied in him. Full stop. Be satisfied in God. Nothing else. Him first. Him fully. Are you struggling with sin? Confess it. Confess it to God. Talk about it. Talk about it in some way. Get in the word really steady. Study it. Not like a checklist, but if you have to do it like a checklist, just do it. God will still speak to you. Don't feel guilty. I'm just doing it like a checklist. God still spoke to me. Put down the devotionals and get into the word. Devotionals about the word aren't alive. God's word is alive. Get in community. Attend groups and be in groups of women like this. And let me say one thing about this kind of group. It should be real and it should be true. And like Kim said on Friday, it should be transparent. And after God spoke Psalm 90 over me, I began to see how important it was that I had true, transparent, honest friends. And I call these friends avocado worthy. So I want to explain that to you because it's become kind of a theme in our women's ministry at my church. Um, so, all right. I had an avocado and I sliced it open. And I looked up and I saw you there. Like, I don't want to be rude. So I offer you, would you like some avocado? Hear my heart here, ladies. Hear my heart. What is the correct response in terms of your facial expression that you should offer me? and reply to, would you like some avocado? Yes. It should be, oh, yes, you would, you would give me some of your amazing avocado? Would you like two dollars each in our avocado? <laughs> That's an avocado-worthy friend, people. That's avocado-worthy. If someone's like, oh, it's your avocado, you're like, no, you don't get an avocado. You did not respond correctly. I'm not going to give you my, you're not worthy of my avocado. I don't give avocado to people like that willy-nilly. <laughs> Maybe cheese is a better metaphor if you don't like avocados, weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> Seven bell ringer with your whatevers, with your okra. <laughs> Maybe cheese is better. So here's my cheese-worthy story also. Trader Joe's, God rest him, but he found her Trader Joe's just died today. Do you know what? Yeah. Is. yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, oh, I'll break it to you. Sorry. <laughs> Who doesn't love Trader Joe's? Like half that table is all Trader Joe's stuff. Anyway, thank God for Trader Joe's. You know what? You just keep that negativity over there. <laughs> God doesn't like Trader Joe's. Pray for her. Anyway, hashtag bless. So um, I, I was at Trader Joe's, and they normally have pretty good cheese, and then they, this seasonally they'll have, like, ridiculously amazing cheese. And I went there, and they had this really fancy schmancy cheese from some cave in Ireland or something like that, and it was coated in black wax, and it was, like, this big wheel of cheese for, like, $300 or something like that, whatever. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, so, so good. <clears throat> so... I bought that regular plain cheese tray that has all the cheese slices with the Monterey Jack and the cheddar and the white cheese and whatever, the normal cheese, whatever. And I put that cheese in the refrigerator as the decoy cheese <laughs> for the husband. <laughs> and I put my good cheese, the Irish cave cheese or whatever, in the black wax around it. I tucked it in the back. I think I put a bag of broccoli in front of it. Like, there's no way he's going to find that cheese. So I went to work that day, and I came home. What was I thinking about all day at home? I'm like, I'm making a cheese board. I'm going to put out my fancy cheese. I'm going to have a glass of wine. It's just going to be great. I'm coming home, and I've got this all built up in my brain, my um, yummy, fun Irish cave cheese. And I get home, open up the um, refrigerator. I'm like, oh, my gosh, where's the cheese? All right, no cheese. So I walked upstairs with my husband, who works from home. <laughs> okay. Those of you listening, you're not you're gonna catch this visual. I'll try to do good with my words here, but I walk into my husband's office, and all I'm seeing is from the back side of his head. So I'm seeing in his big office chair, his head sticking over the top of it, his shoulders, his one arm on the desk like so, and this other arm um, holding a fork, and on the end of a fork, stabbed on the end of a fork, oh, no. is my cake cheese. <laughs> 
wait, it gets better or worse, however you wanted to say it, with a bite taken out of it, like an animal. Like, he just stabbed the cheese, picked it up, and bit the cheese. Like, there was nothing at cheese for it. There was no charcuterie. My husband's alcoholic, so there was no wine for us to enjoy it. And so I'm like, huh. I just, I just froze. Hey, how's the cheese? And he just, like, doesn't even turn around and acknowledge. He's, like, half chewing it. It could have been Velveeta. I mean, it wouldn't yeah. even matter. <laughs> like, it was, it's good. I'm like, <gasps> not cheese worthy. <laughs> no, you are not. Oh, I gotta find better. Put a bag of tampons next time. I don't know how I'm gonna hide this cheese. I gotta do something to keep the cheese safe. So take all my tricks and go home with them. So I don't know. Avocado worthy, cheese worthy. You know how you have friends that come over and you're like, I'm not bringing out the good wine. I love you, but now you're getting two bucks check. You're not wine worthy. Like I'm not bringing out the duck horn for you. You don't even know the difference, duck horn, right? So whatever it is, avocado, wine, cheese, whatever you got. You gather those kinds of people around your life. You gather avocado-worthy people, cheese-worthy, good wine people. You understand what I'm pointing out here? Those are the people that you cultivate into your life. All right, so now let's go back to the 70s. And my sassy, strutting second-grade self. And I strutted. Oh, I strutted. Our street, her house, around the corner, remember? But really, it was about two blocks to get down and around that corner. You had to go on the main road. Like I said, wasn't really even allowed to do that, but I was already in trouble on so many levels. What did I do? I broke the rule. What was the rule? <laughs> Don't touch the, the box. So here I am, an outlaw, in my short shorts, no go-go boots. Would that have been really amazing? <laughs> These boots are made. Okay, so anyway, I'm walking, strutting, as much as a seven-year-old in the 70s can strut down the streets, and I'm feeling it. I am feeling it. It's just like walking by these junior high boys as they're playing in the park, seven years old. What was I thinking? And um, here I am in my short shorts, and I finally turn that corner. I, I'm glancing off side eye to the church as I'm scurrying past the church. No strutting in church, just scurry past. So mom, hopefully, and sisters wouldn't see me, and they did not. And I get to my girlfriend's house, and I walk up to her door, and I'm like practicing what I'm going to say the whole way, and I'm just like halter top and the whole thing, right? Now, she had this older brother who was super cute, super cute. And I'm seven. What am I doing? Super cute. So, older brother. Anyway, um, but she had this really cute older brother. So I knock on the door, and I try to be really full of myself right there and how she'll see these shorts, and it's going to be the best. It's going to be the best. I knock on the door, and um, did I mention I only had sisters growing up? No, nope, no brother. Okay, so she has this cute little brother. I have no brothers at all. She comes to the door, and um, I'm ready for her to flip out and see my awesome short shorts and be super jealous. I'm practicing turning around the whole thing. Again, she has an older brother. And so I have no brothers, which is really important for later. So she gets to the door. She opens the door. And she sees me, and there's no squealing of jealousy. There's screaming of, what are you doing? And she grabs me, and she yanks me mid-twirl, mind you, <laughs> yanks me into her house, all right? As fast as she can get me off of her porch. And she just looks at me in a horror, like, what are you doing? Thinking, well, can't you tell? Clearly, obviously, with the shorts, right? And she says, why are you wearing boys' underwear? <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so they weren't just regular boys' underwear. <laughs> they weren't just regular boys' underwear, mind you. They were the thick cotton boys' training pants. <laughs> oh, my God. Remember I told you, no brothers. I did not grow up with men with, you know, brothers and all that. I'd never seen them before. How would I know? How would I know? <laughs> all right. So after borrowing some actual shorts from my girlfriend, Wendy, I slunk back home. And by some miracle, I made it back before my mom did. And I dropped those boys' underwear shorts <laughs> into the box. I dropped them into the box. And honestly, my mom didn't find out about this story until years later when I started telling the story in public and talking about this. And my sisters were dying. No one knew. I was just like secret sin, right, that I had all this time. And so... Listen, what ends up happening when we fantasize about what will satisfy us is we reach in and we grab the do not touch box, mm. don't we? And we usurp God's authority and God's plan. It's not going to end well. It's not going to end in a cute little fun story probably either. And uh, it can make for a funny story though, actually. 
but it just doesn't end right, right? There's gonna be consequences to what's involved. Ladies, be satisfied in God. Find your satisfaction in Him first. Let His word, His love, even the testimony that He brings through other people that you hear, let that woo you and remind you that you are indeed altogether beautiful. There is no flaw in you, not because of you or anything you've done or deserved or haven't done or haven't deserved. There's no flaw in you because of his true love for you. Let's pray. Father God, you are good. Your mercies do endure forever. And we thank you, God, that they are new every morning and we can wake up and breathe deeply your grace and we need it. And Lord, in this room tonight, I pray, God, for any wounded heart, broken heart, nervous heart, that she would just release it to you, that she would find those avocado-worthy friends to, to bring close into her circle, God, that she would bring good, good, godly counsel and godly women into her life. Lord, I pray that this group of women would be those kinds of women for one another, truly, truly satisfied in you, and that we would be brave and bold and confronting the own sin that we have in ourselves and bring that before you so you can cleanse us, Lord, and make us white as snow. Thank you, God, there is no flaw in us that you could not cover by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for making us beautiful because of your love. And as we continue to serve and love and glorify and worship you, God, continue to grow in us that desire, that passion to be completely and fully and ultimately satisfied in you and you only and let us never settle for anything less than your absolute best in our life and we ask these things in the powerful beautiful name of jesus and everyone said amen, amen. amen.